Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Real-Time AI with Kafka and Streaming Data Analytics. My name is Matt Brown, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we begin, just a few logistical reminders. Today's discussion is being recorded, and you're currently in a listen-only mode. You can submit questions throughout the session using the Q&A functionality in the lower section of your Zoom console. If this is your first time joining a single store webinar, heads up that we present regular webinars demoing data and AI use cases and new technologies. So next Monday, we're gonna be presenting Beginner's Guide to Vector Databases. Come learn about vector database fundamentals, follow along with our demo creating and storing embeddings using Postman, OpenAI, and Single Store DB. If this sounds interesting to you, you can RSVP right now at that bit.ly that's on your screen. You can also take a photo or a screenshot of that QR code that's also on your screen. And I'll... And then I'm also excited to announce that the following week than that, January 24th, we're going to be presenting our big Meet Single Store Pro Max, the data platform. If you've attended our previous webinars, you'll already know that we've positioned Single Store as the best database for real-time AI at scale. The event on January 24th will unveil all the new features that our engineers have been working on uh, for the past several months. We have 1,000 faster vector search using ANN. We've got new on-demand compute service for CPUs and GPUs. We've got a new job scheduler for continuous vectorization of new data streams, and even a new free tier. Probably already know that we have a free trial, but I hope you'll come check out this new free shared tier, which is available to users indefinitely. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, you can RSVP right now. There's that bit.ly on your screen, Meet Pro Max Powerhouse Edition. There's the QR code also on your screen. We have an on-site option for anyone that lives in Silicon Valley and also a virtual option for everyone else around the world. I just heard that this event is almost sold out. I think there's only 28 spots left. So register right now. I think you maybe have a day or two left Well, you can still get a spot. I'll put that link in the chat in a minute as well. Okay. Back to today's topic, we have some fantastic experts that are part of this webinar. They've got a strong grasp of the technologies involved. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as they come in, so keep them coming throughout the session. Um, we'd also love for you to try uh, today's technology and the demo that's going to be coming up. In fact, anyone who tries out this technology today will be entered for a chance to win brand new AirPods Pros. These are latest top of the line released by Apple. All you need to do is click that link that's on your screen, Bitly Real-Time AI Kafka Raffle, or take a photo or screenshot of that QR code. Very simple. Just log into Single Store. We have a free trial, like I mentioned, if you're a new user, or you can log into an existing account if you are already a customer or you have an ongoing trial. Um, we'll check the folks who have logged in to this to this link, and we will announce a winner by the end of today's session. So you don't need to completely follow along with Akmal's demo or you know finish any tutorial or anything like that. It's very simple. If you log in, you're eligible. So stay tuned for that winner. I'll announce before the end of today's session. Let me introduce our speaker for today. Akmal Chowdhury is a senior technical evangelist at Single Store. He's got strong expertise, big data, machine learning, and AI. He is a prolific author and a regular speaker at our weekly webinars on data and AI. Welcome, Akmal. You now have the floor. Great. Well, thank you very much, Matt. And uh, thank you all for joining, especially for those of you who are in the United States. I think it's uh, Martin Luther King uh, Day today. So if you're joining on your uh, public holiday, we we'll really appreciate it. Uh, but for wherever you are, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, and so, as Matt said, uh, I work for Single Store. I've been there roughly two and a half years, a little bit over two and a half years now. And so my focus is very much on uh, uh, education, awareness, uh, and highlighting some of the capabilities of the product. And so uh, the, the cool stuff that Matt mentioned, all these announcements that coming up in the release 8.5, uh, you know, the vector stuff, for example, the GPU support, free tier, lots of great stuff there. So really, you know, please, uh, if uh, you can't attend in person, you know, attend virtually, I think you'll uh, really benefit from that. I, I hear 
There are lots of cool demos and uh, hopefully they'll make them available as well. So that would be pretty awesome. Uh, so in terms of the agenda, well, it's fairly simple and straightforward today. I don't plan to uh, do too much presentation, but I'll do a little bit of an introduction. Okay. And uh, in terms of uh, streaming then, well, IoT is a great uh, kind of uh, use case. And uh, so we'll take a look at that. Okay. And I'll give you a little bit of uh, information about that. Um, as Matt, sent, Matt said, there's some assets that we can share with you, and uh, we'll do that later. Okay, so there is a, a repo, GitHub repo, and uh, there is actually an article as well. Although the article it contains kind of, you know, 80, 90 percent of what I'm going to cover today, but there's a bit more that I'm going to cover today, which I didn't do previously or write about in the article, uh, and that's using Langchain. Uh, so I will be using that to do a bit of kind of AI stuff uh, uh, and adding some capabilities. Uh, to the uh, kind of uh, analytics, if you like, and the queries that we can ask, uh, which makes it a little bit cooler. Uh, there is a small customer case study as well, just to kind of highlight some of the uh, benefits that you have using single store and IoT and Kafka and uh, some architectural patterns as well that we'll show you as well. Okay, and then finally, there's a kind of elements of a demo um, which I've got parts of that actually running and I've had it running for over an hour. So there, we've got a reasonable amount of data there to uh, to work with. Uh, don't worry about all the hyperlinks that uh, Matt shared with you. So he'll post those all in into the chat. Okay, so you can grab those. And, uh, you know, literally the sign up, if you want to be entered for the uh, AirPods, then, uh, it, it, you know, it's less than a minute of your time. Uh, you know, just go to the website. Uh, either you can use Google or Microsoft to uh, log in or just provide a username, ID, and an email address. I think it just checks to make sure you're not a, a bot. And then once you're in, uh, okay, essentially you'll have an environment, which I'll, I'll show you in a few moments' time when I'm uh, working on the demo. Okay. So uh, what will you learn today? How to manage IoT data with the single store? Okay, let me just get my uh, arrows here. Uh, how to stream IoT data with single store using Kafka? Very straightforward. So we've actually got a, a Kafka, a public broker with um, a, a topic, uh, ad tech, okay? Which uh, you are welcome to use as well if you wish to do so. And uh, again, I'll describe that and, and show that to you momentarily. And then I've got Langchain, which is going to provide the kind of the AI element of this. And this is nice because essentially working with a relational database management system, yeah, SQL is cool. You know, it's very, very powerful, but not everybody is skilled in SQL. I mean, it does take a little bit of time to become familiar with it and its capabilities. Um, it's great in terms that you describe to the system what you want and you leave it up to the system to find the best way to retrieve that for you. And, and therefore, you know, things like uh, uh, cost-based optimizers, are, uh, you know, have been researched to death over many, many years. And the, the relational technology has been around for a long time. It's mature, well understood, highly trusted in that lots of environments. Um, but adding this kind of AI flavor to it, I mean, the natural language processing has actually been around for quite a long time, but uh, Langchain just makes it so much of a breeze and very, very easy to get started uh, e almost immediately. A couple of lines of code and away you go. Uh, now, from time to time, I do use this as well, which I think is very helpful in the sense that Metabase is, a, is you know, there's an open source version. There's a free version. So just a jar file, you download it. You just need Java. I've got Java 11 that I'm using, and uh, literally you can create a, a nice visual dashboard as well. You know, in a, in a few minutes, uh, and I've done that. And again, I'll show you that uh, uh, element of it. So if it, if it's something that intrigues you and interests you, that's something very easy to uh, easy to provision as well. Uh, okay, so uh, single story B, just two slides on the product. So. Often we're asked this question, well, at its heart, it is a relational database management system. And historically, go back in time some years ago, and it focused very much on OLTP and in memory. And subsequently, and it used to be called by the name MemSQL, you know, the mem uh, kind of hinting to the fact that it was in memory. Subsequently, columnar storage was added, the ability to do these kind of analytical operations, you know, some min, max, average count at scale. And then this uh, sort of unified 
a single table type that can handle both of these types of requirements now, both the OLTP and the OLAP. And um, uh, point in time recovery as well, uh, shared nothing architecture, if you're familiar with that. And it is MySQL Y compatible. So if you come from the MySQL world in terms of familiarity, the tools that you use and so on, and equally, it is also MongoDB wire compatible. So single stock high is one of the uh, a BSON support, I think, is what's going to be discussed in the event that Matt alluded to uh, a few moments ago, later this month. Um, but uh, Kai was a product that released roughly a year ago or so, and it provides, um, you know, MongoDB compatibility. Let me put it that way. OK, so if you work with the mean stack, the MERN stack, these kind of things, uh, and you're looking for a better way to do analytics, then single store is you know, a, a good choice. So you, you can keep your existing investment if you wish, and then use single store for the analytical part of it, or you can move your MongoDB applications onto single store if you wish to do that as well, you know, uh, just uh, use a single product. Um, so this is the kind of 30,000 foot picture often used. So here you can see we've got this uh, uh, at its core, this uh, universal storage. Okay, and then around it we have a number of ways that we can get fast data in. So here, if you if you look at this carefully, you'll see that we do have the sort of Kafka logo here. Um, can do transformations as well using technologies such as Spark, for example, which I've covered uh, in the past in articles and uh, webinars as well. And there are other mechanisms as well that you can use in terms of bulk loading. For example, you may have data in S3, for example, or Hadoop HDFS. And I think what the animation here is showing is the kind of the, the pipelines, the ingest into single story B. And you're going to see an example of this uh, very shortly as well. I'll show, show you how to set that up. Uh, I've actually had it running, as I said before, for a, an hour and a half, I guess now. And some data have gone in to uh, some tables that I've defined. And uh, we'll, we'll use those for some queries uh, momentarily. Uh, it's available on the three major cloud platforms in the Western world. AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure. Today, we're going to be using uh, AWS. And also, you can run it on-prem if you wish. Uh, once you've uh, signed up and created an account, there is actually a section on there. I think it's under the account management section where you can uh, get yourself a license which will allow you to install a full node version free of charge. I mean, any way you want. You know, it could be... Uh, on your own cloud environment, it could be on a, on a you know one of the cloud uh, environments that we've mentioned there. If you if you want to do it that way, um, equally there is a Docker version as well. Okay, if you want to try it out. But seriously, the the, the easiest and the quickest way to learn uh, without having to uh, install anything locally is to sign up for the cloud based environment. Uh, you know everything's done in the browser, and you'll be seeing that. Uh, you know I'll be using that as well today. Uh, stored data types. So as I mentioned at its heart, it is a relational database management system. In the past, we have covered things like geospatial, for example. There is a Lucene full text uh, search engine built in. Um, JSON support has been there for quite some time, but you know, even better with the, uh, the uh, single store Kai that was released uh, roughly a year ago or so. Uh, time series as well covered that in the last webinar I did, and of course, vectors. So the thing about vectors is that uh, as a product, Single Store has had that support actually since 2017. Um, with the, the interest in this space that has occurred for a year and a bit now, I would say, uh, there is better vector support now. So there is a dedicated vector type, data type that's been introduced as part of 8.5 and some infix operators as well for Euclidean distance dot product if you're interested, and things like uh, approximate nearest neighbor search as well. I mean, that's pretty cool stuff. I, I'm actually looking at all of this myself at this time, uh, and I'll be blogging about it and uh, providing demos and examples in due course. Finally, then just quickly, so real-time decisions, IoT, dynamic experiences in terms of applications. We'll be doing a little bit of IoT today. And then, you know, building things like dashboards. I've got Metabase running. I can show you that. Ad hoc, ad hoc queries. If you're working with SQL, for example, very easy. You can just do run those from the uh, built-in SQL editor. 
Equally, if you want to plug in something like uh, OpenAI and Langchain, for example, or another LLM, if you wish, uh, you can do that. And that's a great way to be able to interrogate the data as well. Okay, so uh, IoT and Kafka. Lots and lots of applications, verticals here, everything there from energy and utilities. You can see supply chains, industrial IoT, tech, insurance, and healthcare. In the past, we've covered things like MarTech, for example. There is actually a uh, MarTech uh, uh, demo and data that you can actually configure as you're provisioning a workspace. That's something that's a kind of a, a checkbox, if you like. You can select that and have that uh, created for you. Uh, but I think from my perspective here, you know, I've done stuff in the past where we've uh, demonstrated things like sensors, for example. And uh, I've worked on some examples uh, also here in terms of weather, air quality, pressure, etc. And so you can see there's a wide range of uh, use cases and uh, wearables, telematics as well, all very, very useful in terms of the, you know, the application where we can apply these today, the, the benefits that we can get. Um, so if you look in the health Healthcare space, for example, this ability to create personalized medicine, you know, people having these sensors on them to be able to report important information about their bodily functions, okay? And then uh, a physician, doctor can take that information along with historical data that's been stored about that patient, the medication they've had, the treatments that they had, and so on and so on, and be able to advise uh, and monitor and, uh, uh, you know, in real time. I mean, that is the real benefit that we get. So lots of possibilities there, as you can see, and perhaps you are working in one of these uh, verticals yourselves. Um, IoT data, inherently time series, increasingly spatial with expanding sources. Okay, so, so some of the uh, possibilities there, data sources, diverse. Okay, everything from sensors, as we said, live video feeds, telematics, multiple formats, could be timestamped, geotagged, generated at irregular or regular intervals. Um, data ingestion. And so it tends to be large quantities of probably fairly small amounts of data, you know, millions and millions of events, small quantities of data being reported. And then we need to be able to store those and manage those and query those as well. I mean, those are important things. And in terms of the life cycle, perishable. So we may need to act very quickly on data that arrive. Uh, no point to store that and then, you know, wait a week or so. That could be the difference between life and death. You know, that's very, very important. So deciding upon that, I think, is very, very important. And then retention period, short or long, okay? There may be reasons why you need to keep data for the long term, legal, medical, other reasons, for example. But you can see that there's a wide range of requirements here that we have in terms of the data. Here is the uh, kind of a proposed high level IoT analytics architecture. And we've seen elements of this being used by some of our customers. Okay, so if I look and start on the left hand side here, you can see the actual IoT devices here, you know, sensors, data, uh, logs, and so on. And we may have some kind of uh, gateway here, or we may be using a, you know, some kind of uh, broker, in this case, Kafka, for example through these pipelines. And then additionally, there may be a, a, you know, other transactional kind of data that we have. So you know, billing systems, customer relationship management, and so on. And these might be stored elsewhere, you know, HDFS S3, we've mentioned those uh, um, a few moments ago. And then if I take a look on the right-hand side, we can see you know, in terms of the real-time analytics, we plug in your favorite uh, uh, tool that you use for building the visualizations, uh, front-end applications, customer portal, for example, or maybe some additional AI or machine learning processes that you have. And then at its heart here, you can see that we can use these pipelines here to ingest the data at scale and speed. And then this kind of universal storage, which gives us the ability to you know, do fast analysis of that both in terms of the analytics, of course, but of course there may be other requirements as well, not just those. Uh, as I said before, uh, historically where the product has come from is from the OLTP space, and in, that has provided really fast performance um, because of the in-memory nature 
of the technology. Uh, streaming data ingest, uh, let's take a look on the left-hand side here. Well, streaming ingestion, fast bulk loading, maybe some kind of transformations that are taken on the data, you know, as it's uh, arriving, uh, we've, we can do this using this sort of create pipeline. I'll show you that very shortly. Uh, we also need some uh, other elements as well, this kind of transactional consistency, okay? So the atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability, the acid qualities, I mean, those are very important in many domains. And with single store, we get the kind of exactly one semantics, which you can do with uh, Kafka as well, okay? So that could be very important. Okay, customer case study quickly. So utility company, real time plus predictive analytics. So essentially the challenge that they were facing was that they were using an existing technology, SAP HANA, and it was proving to be a little bit too costly for them in terms of their data demands and the, the level of data growth that they were seeing, complex ar architecture, maintenance. And so the solution was they were looking for a platform that supported real time and historical data analysis with relational SQL while offering simple elasticity for future data growth. Well, single store seems like a you know a great fit uh, in this uh, scenario. And in fact, they decided to, to do exactly that. They chose this as uh, the product. And so the main outcome here was that they achieved the high performance analytics, TCO, very important to business people. So from the developer's perspective, I mean, choosing something like single store is great because one product, you know, all of the stuff that we've mentioned in terms of its capabilities and support, you know, the multi-model, for example, um, the ability to do OLTP and OLAP, all of these have great benefits because it makes the life of the developer much easier. And then from the business perspective, it's great because now the business person, you know, in terms of TCO is a lot lower. You don't have to use like five or six different products to achieve the same thing. Uh, you are using just the one product to achieve all of that and getting much better return in terms of your investment. Uh, this particular uh, customer is smart meters. Okay. This is something that uh, you may have installed in your own home. I, I had one done in mine a couple of years ago. It's actually made my life a lot easier. <laughs> Instead of having to return these meter readings to my energy supplier now, automatically at midnight every day, uh, these get sent and I get the bills that reflect uh, my usage, okay, rather than estimates uh, and then having to pay them more money. So I pay what I use and that really, you know, it makes me happy. I'm sure they are happy as well. Um, so it, as far as the existing architecture for this utility provider, well, it looks something like this, okay? So I won't go into too much detail here, but if we look on the right-hand side here, we've essentially got these meter readings that we need to take. Okay, there is an enterprise service bus. And then we've got a couple of these data marts, as you can see, a variety of different systems that uh, are being used to manage uh, the data here. And then ultimately, of course, you know, it's important to have these kind of dashboards. Uh, and in this particular case, they're using Tableau, for example, as well as the command line and uh, SAP business objects. And what they were able to do then is simplify their architecture somewhat, as you can see. So single store takes on much more responsibility here. Uh, notice that SAP HANA is still part of the mix here because it's not totally, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, removed, but still elements of that being used. And that is fairly common. Okay? I mean, it can be the situation in many environments where you have a significant investment in an existing technology. It, it may do a wide range of things for you, but some of those things are the pain points, you know, the things that cause you grief. Uh, in, in your uh, environments in terms of the technology. And therefore, for those parts, it makes sense to replace them. And yes, you keep your existing investment. The, the system may be perfectly suited to other requirements as well. That's absolutely fine. Um, but um, we can see here that, uh, you know, elements of this certainly simplified and made the life of this uh, utility company a lot easier. Okay, so enough said there. Uh, in terms of the demo, let me um, just mention one thing. So in the past, I've uh, demoed this and shown this as well. So think about these kind of IoT devices. Here you've got a visualization of part of the uh, uh, part of the Earth. Mostly you've got North America here 
on the uh, left hand side, as you can see, uh, we got elements of South America here, a little bit there, a little bit of Africa here, and uh, Europe. Uh, but you can see that these devices here represent sensors that could be located globally, could be in the sea, could be on land. We might be interested in asking questions, for example, uh, you know, for this particular um, polygon, you know, maybe it represents a, a part of uh, the ocean. We might be interested in what uh, particular sensors are located there, what are the temperature readings that they are sending out, and so on. Um, Land-based sensors might be slightly different. Okay, there may be other things that we measure. So, you know, the could be differences in the types of uh, data that we are collecting based upon the sort of uh, geographical location. Now, in our case, uh, we're doing something a little bit simpler, but we are using a kind of a geo element to it. Okay, so we're going to do some ad tech data. Um, and in terms of the demo architecture, you can see that this is kind of drawn from what I showed you a little bit earlier, but obviously because of time, uh, we've simplified it some lot, some, somewhat. So uh, I've got some event data that's being um, generated. I have a Kafka broker, which is acting as the means to be able to stream this in. Uh, I'm using pipelines here to connect to that Kafka broker. And at scale, I'm reading the, the these event information in. And I've got Metabase now if you're kind of sharp-eyed, you'll see that uh, um, the phrase I'm using here is near real time, okay? And that's stretching the truth a little bit, okay? So in actual fact, the because I'm using the open source version of Metabase, essentially it's able to do the minimum kind of time slot that you can give it in terms of updates that it can do for you is like one minute. So every minute it will refresh. Um, so I'll show you that in just a moment, okay? So, but... You know, you, you you get the idea. I think. I mean, this is remember. This is just a an example, a possible uh, scenario. I'm sure you can think of better ways that you could uh, do this. So, let me just uh, pose this down just for a moment, and let me show you that. Uh, and and again, Matt, please keep me straight. So, I, if I'm talking about something, and you can't see what I'm talking about, do let me know. All right. So I don't want. To, the audience to be uh, waiting on my words, but uh, here we go. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm running this inside a Linux virtual machine. So this is um, using uh, Metabase. And uh, uh, as I said before, I've had this running for a while now. So I've created a couple of uh, simple visualizations for this ad tech data, which by the way, I'll show you the schema and I'll show you the uh, uh, the Kafka uh, you know, the pipeline details as well momentarily. So uh, up to this point in time, it's 14.9 uh, million total number of events. And then you can see I've, I've got uh, events by region here, this one, okay? And for this, I opted to do a pie chart. And for this one, uh, the country that comes out top, this region is the United States with over 10 million. And then we've got a few others uh, Australia, Germany, Canada, for example. These are the top ones that are being displayed here. And then on the right-hand side, I've got events by top five advertisers. Okay, so here in this particular data set, I've got Subway, Yum Brands, Starbucks, Dollar General, Dunkin' Brand Group. Okay, and then just below here, I've got a sort of tabular uh, which is ad businesses by gender and income. So this is a fairly chunky piece of SQL that's doing that. Uh, I'll show you the code for that in just a moment. Um, and then just here, again, if you're fairly sharp-eyed, you can see this thing here. It's uh, refreshing every minute. So if you're careful, all uh, right, let's have a look. It's about... Uh, a quarter of the way through a cycle at the moment. So if we if we wait just a few moments, let's say 30 seconds or so, it's almost half done. Yeah, it's, it's about half done now. And so when it gets back to the top again, possibly we should see these numbers refreshed. Uh, I don't know if there'll be a huge difference in them. So we could sort of uh, see if there's a, um, a difference in terms of the... Uh, the totals here, but it is refreshing and there is a feed and data are arriving. And so let's see about 15 seconds or so before it reaches the top again and refreshes. So let's just wait for that. 
There we go. Okay, so I see that this number here went up from 14.9 to 15 million. Okay, so that was the most obvious one there. But uh, I'll show you the structure of this in just a moment then. Okay, now uh, let me just uh, move some stuff around on my screen here to give me a bit of real estate uh, so I can work with, with this. Okay, so I'll just shift this about a little bit and just make this a little bit smaller here just for a moment. And this as well. Um, okay, so what I have is I can show you this. Okay, so this is using something called Kafka Cat. Okay, so basically I'm just uh, set this up as a consumer. Okay, and it's pointing to this uh, public uh, uh, Kafka mem compute, and I'm just asking it, you know, show me this particular topic called add events. So if I do this. You can see the actual data that's being streamed in. There you go. Okay. And I'll do a control C here. Okay. Just to stop that. So essentially we've got a little bit of data here. And again, I'll show you the schema in a moment, but um, let me just try and get my box. I think that would be a lot better. Here we go. This is kind of like one row here. Now in this data, this feed, there is actually an error. One of these um, columns, if I can put it that way, uh, they are kind of tab separated, but there is a mistake. It's supposed to have a single numeric uh, integer value. In actual fact, what we've got is uh, an error here. You can see this one. All right, uh, here's another one. There's a five and a 13, and then a one and a 10. So essentially it should just be one number. But for some reason, there is an error being generated. And that's possible, okay? That can happen in real data feed. In this particular case, I don't know whether it was intentional or by accident, but in fact, in actual fact, we have a, a problem with this data feed. Now, um, normally when we would ingest the data, a uh, single store would complain. It would say, well, hang on a minute. You've shown me this particular schema, but the data looks like this. You know, there's an error. Uh, and so we can tell it to ignore this uh, problem and just take essentially the first value. So it's, you know, it, it's a little bit forgiving. It gives us the opportunity to still do something. Um, and of course, longer term, we would want to investigate why this problem is occurring. Okay. I mean, this, in this particular demo, not a, not a big issue since it's fake data anyway, and we're not really concerned about it, but in reality, in your environment, you would be obviously, and you would worry about it because you want to ensure that you're using the correct data for this, uh, particular problem. Okay, so let me minimize this and let's have a look at, uh, bear with me, let me just get my uh, it's wrong window. Okay, this is what we want and just uh, minimize this, there we go. Okay, so this is the portal which uh, you'll see something similar to this uh, once uh, you've uh, created your um, uh, account for the cloud environment. And as you can see on the left-hand side here, let me make this bigger. Okay, so we uh, like use up all the uh, space on the screen. You can see here, that there's this kind of uh, left nav, okay that contains a lot of these uh, kind of commands and the ability to kind of navigate around. And so what I've done is I've previously uh, provisioned a workspace. And um, I, as I said before, I'm using AWS to do that. And this is the uh, SQL editor that I'm currently in. And I'll show you what the, uh, what the commands are. Okay, so here you can see on the left-hand side, so essentially all I've done is I've created this ad tech database here. Okay. And then I've got uh, this table of storing events. Okay. So these are like events as part of an ad campaign. All right. So what I have is a user ID, an event name, the advertiser, the particular campaign that I'm using. And then I've got a little bit of information, the gender uh, uh, of the person, you know, that may have clicked on something, 
what is their income you know maybe they registered previously on a, on some website or something a page url uh, the region okay you saw a little bit of that when i showed you the metabase so it, it's it's done by on the basis of country for example that's how i did the grouping for that particular query and uh, there's uh, a little bit of information there in terms of the sort key as well so that is essentially the event data and then what i've got is I am keeping some data in memory simply because it's a small amount of data. So for that, I can use this thing called a reference table, which essentially does exactly that. And it can hold these campaign values here, which I've got on the left-hand side here. Okay, so just uh, there. Okay, so these are kind of 14 different uh, campaigns that I'm using, okay. So as you can see, two tables, one to capture the event data, one is, uh, you know, if I want to do a join across and be able to reference the particular campaign that I'm running. And so in this case, it could be like demand great, blackout, flame broiled, take it from a fish, and so on and so on. And then you can see there's a, a little bit of a US focus here because the very last one here is a Super Bowl tweet, for example. Okay, so that's number 14. Um, what I have in terms of where these events are coming from, it's here, okay? This is a Kafka pipeline. Okay, let me just show you this, okay? So this is using that same public Kafka that uh, I showed you a few moments ago in my virtual machine, and there's the topic, okay, add events. And uh, I've throttled it a little bit, okay, to uh, slow it down. 2,500 milliseconds, and then essentially just describe it. It feels terminated by a tab, enclosed by a single quote, escaped by two backslashes, line starting by, you know, uh, null. It's, uh, it, you know, two quotes with no value there, and then just saying where this data is going in. Okay, here. You can see all of these things here, all these fields, okay. Um, the, as I mentioned, there is an error in the data and you can tell single store to basically ignore that. So this keyword here, ignore, is doing exactly that. Without this, it would just give an error and then it would just wait for you to, you know, either fix the, uh, fix the error or, you know, use this keyword to essentially say, well, okay, I know there's a problem, but for now, just ignore that and then just uh, uh, take the data. And it does a pretty good job in terms of, uh, um, you know, reading the data from the feed. Um, all I've simply done is then to tell it, okay, start from the earliest one, the earliest offset, okay? And when it's not running, you can run this kind of test pipeline command, which essentially I have a, a result just below. If you're sharp-eyed, you can see here that this is done a little bit earlier. So this is just returning some values. Okay, so I've got the... Uh, user ID here, the event name, the advertiser, okay, what the campaign number is is this, and then whether what's the gender, male or female, what's their income range, page URL, and so on. I mean, you get the idea, okay? And then finally, all I did was just say, start the pipeline, okay? And so this has been running for a little while now. So what we can do then is, in addition to running the SQL queries here, and then you saw me with the uh, metabase as well, where I've also copy and pasted the uh, SQL commands, I can do these from a notebook as well, okay? And again, Matt will send you the uh, the link to this. This is a kind of a, a nice way to be able to do some trial and error, you know, some simple coding uh, just to test it out. And obviously, if you want to take it a step further, I mean, this is the Jupyter environment, okay? So if you're familiar with with Python, for example, you can do SQL commands here directly, which is what I'm going to be running. I'll show you that MIDI uh, kind of SQL command to do that last query um, where we're sort of grouping by uh, income and gender. Uh, and all I've needed to do here is basically specify the database and the, the workspace that uh, uh, I'm using here. Okay. And so you can see I've run this earlier. Now, what I'll do is let me just clear this. Okay, so we can start from scratch. There we go. And let's try this. Okay, so total number of events. Let's just find out 
how many we have now. Okay, and it's up to, you saw a few moments ago, we, we got up to 15 million. Well, it's gone up a bit more since then. Okay, so we're almost at 15 and a half million now. Okay, the data is sort of streaming in. Here's the uh, by region. Okay, so we select country. And then we do a count of the uh, country as well. There we go. And so this is just putting putting them in uh, in uh, um, descending order. Okay, so the highest one appears at the top, which uh, currently happens to be the US. It's about 10 and a half million. And the rest, you can see Canada, Australia, Germany, Spain, Great Britain, uh, Netherlands, Brazil, France. And I think that's Argentina on the bottom. Um, events by top five advertisers. Now, the thing is here, keep in mind that this query is being a bit selective. So yes, it's top five advertisers, but it does some specification here. So it says advertisers like Subway, like McDonald's, like Starbucks, okay? And so in this case, we are kind of limiting the range a little bit. So we do get these uh, uh, back. And currently, it seems that we have uh, Subway in the lead there with Yum Brands and then Starbucks, Dollar General, Duncan Brands Group. Okay. And then here's that really hefty piece of uh, SQL advertisers visitors by gender and income. Try doing this in a NoSQL database. Okay. So <laughs> let me just uh, run that. And that gives you a, a nice kind of uh, grouping in terms of the salary ranges that we have. Uh, okay, so take time to understand that query, okay? It's actually doing quite a lot. And so we're doing a sort of tabulation of that, okay? So repeating it, what we saw in the metabase, but just having the kind of the textual output here, you could create matplotlib, for example, or you know use Plotly or Express or something here to create the visualizations if you wish, that's perfectly possible. But I think the, the nice thing here is the addition of Langchain, uh, the AI element, if you like. So here, what we'll do is uh, I've pinned these to specific versions. Okay, this is 0.1 of Langchain and OpenAI. 171. This is rather important because these technologies seem to change rather a lot, rather frequently. And so as I found out the last time I presented, which was not that long ago, I think about a week ago, uh, things break, even though you sometimes pin them to specific library versions. Okay, so it's a good idea to keep your eye on the ball, you know, don't, uh, don't take your eye off there. Stuff just moves so fast in this space. And then here, I'll just put my API key in. I hope I didn't click on something. Let's just see. I, let's just see if it will do that. No. Okay. Bear with me one moment. And let me just pause the share there a sec. Okay. Just give me a sec whilst I... Find my open AI key. Let's see where I can get that from. I thought I'd copied and pasted it on on the air. Obviously not. Where's the way? There we go. Okay, so resume the share and just make this bigger again. Let's try that again. Okay. There we go. There's my open AI key. Paste that in there. And just a couple of imports. Okay, this is just to set up the, uh, the environment. Um, and then here, uh, this is the stuff that's changed recently as well. So the way that uh, some of these open AI models are now deprecated and you can't actually call them. And so I think the replacement for this type of query is this one, GPT 3.5 Turbo Instruct. So you just need to put that in there. And essentially what we're doing here then is using the LLM. Okay, you can see here, there's some warning messages here. Uh, I may get around to fixing that at some point, but for now it's fine. Uh, with the uh, pinned versions that I've provided, it should be okay. 
And then what I can do is just ask intelligent questions of the database system. So let's go back here a sec, okay? And then take a look at, uh, there we go. Let's try total number of events first, something super simple, okay? And so I ask the question and I can say to it, what is the total number of events in the events table? Question mark. There we go. Okay, so again, warning message. And now it's given me this figure of 15.7 million. So it's obviously gone up somewhat since uh, we last queried. All right. And then we could try one of these other ones as well. And we could say, how about this one? The events by top five advertisers, but without the kind of restrictions that we put into our SQL query, we could ask, let's try that again. Right. Show me the top five advertisers from the events table. All right. That's interesting there. Can you see it's only come up with one, Yum Brands. So in this case, even though I was quite specific uh, and asked for the top five, it's only given me one. So the, there is a way that we can see what it's actually doing here. This verbose equals false, we can set it to true. Okay, so we can just rerun this. So just ask it, you know, show me your working out. So in this case, let me just copy that and we can try that again. Oops, sorry. Uh, trying to be too clever there. Let's copy that and then just try this again. Okay. And just paste that in. And now let's see. So with this, Langchain would tell us and show us its kind of thinking, if you like, what is the process that it's using to uh, answer that query so thought, I should query the schema of the events table to see what columns I can use. And it does that. And it takes a look at the uh, events table here. Okay. And then it's picked up three rows from there, just below there. I'm assuming just to kind of sample. Yeah, and just to take a look what the structure looks like. And then it says, I should query the events table for the top five advertisers. And then if we take a look, it says here, select advertiser from events, order by advertiser descending limit five. Observation is yum brands, yum brands, yum brands, yum brands, yum brands, right? So now that's the reason why it's come out like this, okay? So essentially it, it's, uh, it, you know, because it's the same thing all uh, in all cases, essentially, I mean, the answer is just one, right? There's only one of those. So it hasn't been able to distinguish, but uh, you get the idea, okay? So useful to a point. Uh, yes, you can see it's working out. The fact that you have the ability to kind of ask these natural language qu questions is helpful. Don't necessarily get the answer you want all the time, right? You have to be fairly specific. You give it enough context and, and you know precision in terms of ask it precisely what it is you're looking for and then where it should target its, uh, its uh, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, w the specific table. So you can see I am, I'm definitely asking it for the events table. Um, so that could be very useful, okay? Uh, and again, an alternative way to be able to query the database and be able to utilize uh, AI for something very practical here. And of course, um, I think, let me take a look here. Let me just minimize this, all right? So I realize we're almost out of time. So let's just summarize then. And we'll take some questions from you. Okay. So challenges with traditional IoT, some use case special purpose time series databases may be appropriate, but now with single store, for example, we've mentioned that it can support a wide range of different use cases. It can work with a variety of different types as well in terms of the uh, multimodal capabilities it has. So the geospatial, for example, I've used that that example that I showed you with the, the you know 
parts of the map of North America, South America, Europe, and uh, bits of Africa, as well as the Atlantic Ocean, with the, the little uh, markers showing the location of the sensors. That is actually an example I did with geospatial. Okay. Um, but um, real time analytics. Oops, pardon me. Just gone on too fast. There we go. Let me just get that back. Single stores, powerful ingestion, universal storage capabilities. Okay. So the pipeline's awesome. Parallel. We saw us connecting to a Kafka feed, ingesting that, and it's been running for some time now. Um, working fine. Proven outcomes. Customers in diverse industries, such as energy, utilities, and so on. I gave you a little bit of a quick example from the uh, energy domain. And uh, again, the customer has re really achieved tangible and you know deliverable benefits from uh, utilizing single store DB for that particular problem domain. Okay, let me just... Uh, Thank you. And I know Matt will want me to show these, but stop there a moment, take some questions, Matt, and uh, then I'll be happy to uh, just uh, show these last two slides again. Okay. Awesome. Sounds people. good. Yeah, oh, let's actually, do it. Actually, I could do this whilst uh, we, we have the questions. I could show this. Okay. Cool. A reminder, everyone, you can participate in the live Q&A right now. There's a button at the bottom of your Zoom console that says Q. Q&A, feel free to come in and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, Akmal, the first one I have in the list is from Edward. Uh, can't I do analytics and run scripts on AWS? What additional advantages do I get with a single store layer? Database management system. What is a database management system for? It is a means to allow multiple users to access the uh, your data in a controlled and you know well-known way. So we talked about the asset properties, for example, atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. You have, you know, if some disaster strikes, the, the goal of the database system is to manage the data for you. Uh, short of, uh, you know, an asteroid hitting the earth or something like that, where we'd, we'd probably all die. I mean, <laughs> the, the fact is that a database management system globally distributed can really provide significant benefits. And remember, single store is a distributed SQL database. Okay, so globally, it could span the world. You could have disaster recovery, which again, we've got some cool you know, stuff coming in that space as well. Um, and so it really provides a lot of benefits, I think. It's a, it's a way to manage your resources in an efficient way and a controlled way and allow multiple users to access that as well. So you're not kind of treading on other people's toes, what, that is what a DBMS does. I mean, essentially, it manages those resources for you, allows you to access the data, as well as your other colleagues, as well as your customers, if you open it up to them for as well. As well. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks, Akmal. This one from Hussein, I, I'm going to try to paraphrase it, or at least my interpretation of it. I think it is, can you trust queries created by LLMs? Um, what about when you use AI with multiple data sources, like the database you showed and or weather data, rather than using it as a SQL query builder? Yeah. Okay. So to take the first part, that's a great question. What is the sort of level of confidence that you have in uh, you, you know what you're trying to do with the data there? And so in this particular case, um, you'll see, and again, if you're sharp-eyed and you've worked with this stuff before, you can see that I have used this uh, setting here called temperature uh, equals zero, okay? So this provides kind of deterministic answers. And then the other thing that you can do is that when you're working with LLMs, essentially you can tell the LLM, okay, don't hallucinate, don't make answers up. If you don't know, just say you don't know, okay? But the thing is that with this particular instance here, uh, that I have high confidence that the answers that I'm getting back here are actually you know, what I'm expecting or within the same sort of ballpark range that I'm expecting. Now, um, would AI be really designed for this problem? Well, you could say yes and no. I, I think the, the key benefits it gives you is the ability for average users like myself, for example, who aren't necessarily working with database systems or SQL all the time, but would like to be able to query the system and get back useful information from it to be asking those in a natural language way, just as I would have a conversation with you, for example, or Matt, or somebody else. I mean, that seems to me a good way to do it. Uh, over time, of course, these technologies will improve and get better. 
And uh, I, I think that, you know, as always, it is just a tool in the toolbox. Uh, it may not be the right answer for every problem, but it might be helpful in certain circumstances. And so that's, I think, the, the best way to address that. And of course, yes, to, to address the second part, um, you know, there are multiple LLMs out there. It's a question of deciding which one is the best fit for you. You know, there are open source, there are commercial, you have to decide. And then again, there's this issue about confidentiality as well, whether you're comfortable sending data across the wire to a third party to evaluate for you and send the answers back. We talked about this previously. So for example, if you're an AWS customer, you could use something like Bedrock, for example, you could create a private cloud, you can utilize the technologies within that environment and be very confident that you know it's contained within that environment. It's not, you know, stuff is not kind of leaking out to the outside world, if you like. You, know, you do have that privacy, if you like. Good stuff. There's multiple questions I see that are kind of similar, so I'm going to lump them together. Uh, one is how do, you, how do you integrate AWS infrastructure as a source to, to single store? Another is, is single store SaaS application? Does the resi data reside in AWS or single store? Another one that says, what about on-premise? So I'll lump those together to let you tackle that. Okay, so uh, keep in mind that single store is a database management system. And yes, we are in the AWS market uh, um, place. Okay, so you can search for us there, you'll find us there, um, and we are available there, but we are separate, okay? We, we are a DBMS that is available on the AWS platform. And it is very much a database management system, not just something that uh, that's just stored in in kind of uh, the ether, if you like, if I can put it that way. You can, I mean, it's it's all a question of where you want your results to be stored and where you may have data coming in, where you want data going out. But uh, think of single store as that kind of repository that uh, managed by a DBMS for you, giving you those kind of strong um, capabilities in terms of the asset properties. Um, that is, I think, the, the key selling points of that. It is a database management system, first and foremost. Um, it just happens to live in the cloud, and it, it just happens that you can use it on AWS or Google or, uh, you know, Microsoft as your, as as the sort of platforms and where it runs. Uh, but if you try it out in the cloud-based stuff, everything you saw today, I was doing in the cloud, okay? Using the AWS platform as part of that. And so it's worth to kind of test that out and try that out for yourselves. Awesome. I see a question here from Charles about um, is data buffering required for managing data chunk sizes? And I know every webinar we get lots of questions yeah. about chunk sizes. So I wonder if you could answer that one. Yeah, chunk sizes is a good one. I mean, the, the think about it. The, the reason we have to do it is that if, for example, uh, you're doing, say, uh, storing documents, um, inside your DBMS, uh, you, you want to build some kind of RAG app, uh, ultimately, then we, we've we demoed this previously. So there, there's a great, uh, in, in um, single store spaces, or I think one of the webinar uh, URLs that we have on our GitHub repo, Matt, we've got uh, uh, something that AWS very kindly provided for us. So it's a great example because what it shows is that it takes a whole bunch of PDF documents, chunks them up, stores them in single store, allows us to ask intelligent questions of that. But the reason we have to chunk it up is because if you think about it, if we don't know what the sizes of these PDF documents might be, they might be tiny or they may be huge. Um, if you store them as a huge document, are you exceeding the limits of the kind of tokens that if you like, that you can generate from them, despite the fact that we, you, we can, you know, the, the limits always go up and up and up all the time. It's getting better and better in terms of the scale of these things. Uh, but it, how to chunk it up is an art. <laughs> no easy answer to that. Uh, there are techniques around, and it's a question of finding something, a good balance between something that is, you know, reasonable size, can be easily tokenized, doesn't cost too much, okay? And you can store it fairly easily in terms of the sizes of the, uh, of the vectors that you're generating, um, and then be able to ask intelligent questions of the data. So it's a great question. I, I wish there was an easy answer for it, but I, I still haven't come across one. If anyone knows that, you know, do, do let us know. We'd always be interested in that. Good stuff. I'm going to give you one more fast before we go to the AirPods winner announcement. Srinivas asks, do you have documents that capture the architecture uh, you've described here? One example for MarTech, one example we're interested in is how would our in-house 
built recommender system interface with single store and generate recommendations based on the customer's clickstream interactions. Uh, okay. Um, I can only give you an example. I mean, the, if reach out to us at team at singlestore.com, T E A M at singlestore.com, we can help you, uh, you know, find a technical resource internally to assist you with that. That looks like a fairly sort of hands on kind of thing. All I would say is that, yes, I built a recommender system in the past using vectors. Uh, but it's not taking streaming data. It's using static data to be able to do that. And so extending that with a kind of stream source, if you like, I don't see that, that as a big challenge. Single store should be able to manage that. But again, uh, you know, reach out to us, please. We'll be happy to, to talk to you and then, you know, discuss with you a suitable architecture and, and how single store could fit into this environment. Perfect. Thank you, Akmal. All right, let's get to that AirPods winner. A uh, quick note, as I mentioned during the intro on Monday, we've got Beginner's Guide to Vector Databases. Highly recommend you check that out. RSVP now. I just put the link in the chat, so you can just click it right there. Um, and then on January 24th, we're presenting our Meet Single Store Pro Max. These are all of our newest um, features for Single Store, empowering new real-time AI, uh, faster vector search, on-demand compute, uh, free forever tier and a lot more. Um, so hopefully you'll register for that. Like I said, during the intro, I think there's just a few spots left. So if you don't register today or tomorrow, I'm not sure that there will be a spot, but I just put that link in the chat as well. The announcement you've been waiting for today's AirPods go to Hausik Karapayaya. Sorry if I, I'm sure I butchered that. You're a senior software engineer at Fiserv. Congrats, Kausik. Thank you for joining us. If that's not you, don't give up. We're going to announce one more AirPods winner by the end of the day to anyone who tries out Akmal's demo. I will put the GitHub in the chat and I would encourage you to try that out. Like I said, we're going to announce one more AirPods winner. I'm also going to be sending everything that you've seen today by email to all registrants. So the GitHub you'll get by email, the recording of this. Relevant resources you will all get later today. So thank you, Akmal, for an amazing presentation as always. Thank you to our audience for joining us and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.